card. Are you ready? So, if you remember last week, we tried uh, to cover the, uh, the main concept of MR MRI physics, right? We did kind of fast in order to be able to start to think how those things can be used and are used in, in researching the human brain. And I will ju and just will do a, a brief uh, summary of what we did uh, last week. I will focus on the thing that I find more relevant. Uh, so I told you that the, the source of the signal are what? Relaxation of what? Hydrogen, of protons. And we said that the orientation of these protons inside magnetic field, with outside of magnetic field, they have, they have no orientation. Okay? It's the orientation, by the way, of this, this phenomena, of these spins. It's not, a, not orientation of, of, of protons. So don't, someone ask me, and it is a typical uh, mistake, and maybe I wasn't clear enough. It's not that the water physically orients themselves. No, it's their spin phenomena that is now essentially, if you, you can think about it as being oriented toward the magnetic field. When we are inside, inside a strong magnetic field, we can summarize all those protons and we get a magnetization vector. That's what we said. And I mentioned that this vector we, we can, is uh, processing uh, around the main magnetic field. Right, and so it also have um, some x y projection. And why why do I care about the x y projection? Do you remember? I w th please help me with the names. I I want to remember the names and I need to learn. And in the end, I need to grade about also participation. So, matan. Huh? So do you remember why x y projection is we care about it at all? We me the, the main field is along the z direction, right? But can we measure on the z direction? Right, right. So we have we have to move, uh, or we can only measure in the x y direction, and we'll do whatever we can to project the the, the signal to the x y direction. Um, whoop! I didn't mean to do that. And so we use something we called how. What w what are what are we doing to move the signal the signal to the to the XY plane? Does anyone remember? Excitation, yeah. The name? Helio. Uh, so we use excitation. This the yellow thing in here. Um, so just when you say when you answer, just say your name in the first. I don't know. I think I'm get, I gonna get used to it. Um, um, and so, and then what 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 is happening is that the 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 magnetization vector or the projection to the X-ray plane might grow or, or might not. Right? We said that we can go all the way to one 180, and then again we have no almost no projection. But we can increase the projection, and we kind of taking the system out of uh, of, uh, of 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 the steady state uh, situation that it was before. And when we turn off the excitation, uh, then we can. We can start listen, right? And so we had the, I, and and there will be a vector on the XY plane, and and we will put what in order to measure. Who remember? What was there? What, what allow us the measurement? What? There, are, there, there are coils, and there is a what? There is there is a current that we measure inside the coil because because of what phenomena? This is the second thing. So you, you, you say two things in, in together. What's your name? Levy. Yeah. So, 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 so you were saying you, you did that, and, and you didn't with your hand. You did two things with your hands. So maybe well, tease them apart. Well, you know, I think that there's a, I mean, the magnetic field creates an electrical current. Yes. The coils, the magnetic so moving electric uh, magnetic field creating an electric current that can be measured by the receiver, and there was another phenomenon that you you also. Did the, did, did the gesture? So the real line back to the 
Okay, so there is the realignment back to the main migration, which is relaxation. Right. Um, okay, so this is just if you want the 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 this vector in the x y plane, and there will be here the receiver who will measure that. Right. That's the that that's the basic of of this measurement, and we talked about two two relaxation phenomena. One we called T1, which was what you just said, maybe the, the relaxation to the main magnetic field, right? So from, from being projected or being in the, uh, being in, in, a, in a, an excited, uh, excited uh, um, state of those proton not being aligned to the magnetic field, they will go back to, to be aligned with the magnetic field, relax relax the energy, energy, and we said this is exponential decay, uh, and we also gave numbers. We s do you remember the numbers? That's not a, anyone remember what was the time scale? Musa? Normal frequency is a different issue, but what, what was the relaxation? About second, yeah, uh, right, four seconds for, for pure water, CSF, and about a second inside uh, white and gray matter, there will be a difference. That will be very useful. This phenomena itself, the, the fact that there are small differences in the T1 relaxation, not so small, say, something between 0.8 millisecond, 0.8 second, 1.2 second, white matter to gray matter, that would create the contrast. I will, I will talk about it in a second. Okay, what is the other phenomena, who remember? Anyone want to help me here? Uh, or oh. um, transverse relaxation? Yes. So you said many, many important things. First, uh, the pheno it's called T2, and it's also an exponential relaxation. And uh, what happened in here, the, the w there, was ve there was a vector of spin which were, were in phase, and so that's why we couldn't measure them, because they were summing up together to, to, to give us a, a magnetic vector that we could measure. And they're losing the f their phase. They, they're, not move they're not projecting exactly the same, with the same phase in the XY plane, and so we're losing signal. So that was the, so that that essentially this dephasing of the signal is uh, is the T2 decay, and you in, indeed you say it's faster, it's faster than the T1. So we're going to lose the signal first by T2 before it will relax. And I mentioned, I will mention again later on that uh, probably not today, that there is a well, do I have it here? Yes, I also mentioned that in the class in in class last time that this T2 can be split to two phenomena one which we call T2, and the other one which is T tag, which together create T2 star. And that was, uh, who cares about that? We care about that because part of that will be uh, uh, important for, for functional MRI, okay? The main use in neuroscience uh, in the MRI of the MRI tool is still for fMRI. So not my research, but the mo most of the user that using MRI, they're using it for fMRI. And in fMRI, we really care about this T2 star because we said that this T2 phenomena, this is a spin-spin interaction, so this is more, will be related more to anatomy in many ways, so how spin affects spins. And the other one, which is everything else that caused them to deface, and there is a, a one thing that is interesting and we can harvest, and we will harvest in few, in few classes, and that will be the effect of the oxygen, the oxyhemoglobin. One of them is paramagnetic, and creating a faster decay. So if a tissue uh, or a, a neurons in the brain uh, work hard and use a lot of resources, there is a change between oxy and the oxy hemoglobin, and that will be manifest in this T2 star relaxation. So in the future, that will be important for us. Um, and I mentioned several sequences, and that was, I guess, the hardest part almost the hardest part uh, last time. The, I mean, maybe the hardest part was the, all this Fourier transform thing. But I'm not going to talk about it. Um, uh, and uh, what, what was important there is that there were different manipulation of how we project this vector to the, to the 90 and, the, and 180 or how, how long we wait before there is an echo. All this manipulation allow us to get images which are weighted 
by T1, by T2, by the amount of protons, what's called proton density, by T2 stars. So there are manipulation of the pool sequence, how we, we push them to, to 180 or to 80 or wait some time. I, I show you the inversion thing trick. This one, right? We put in 180 before, uh, something called spin echo. Uh, there is no point for you to remember. I mean, unless you're going to do it, it I'm, I'm not... Important, but the, imp the important aspect for me is that you know that there, there are ways to play with the pulse sequence, the order of, of those uh, excitations and the time that we wait between exc one excitation to another, and by that, get a different weight of, the, of this uh, physical phenomenon, the T1, the T2, the T2 star, and also another one which is important called proton density. This is the fraction of water to non-water. Okay? Um, okay, so we have a way to measure those physical phenomena, at least be sensitive to these physical phenomena, I will show you in a second, in the brain. So, till now it was physics, and it could have been done in NMR machine, and then actually this, all of those experiments was originally done in NMR machine in the 40s and 50s, and around the 80s, that's something that moved to, to 70s and 80s, and later on, become really big, 90s, and, 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 and in our time, it's something that we use in the brain for, for uh, to, to get a full image. Uh, well, again, not the right click. And so, why we care about that? So I already mentioned that. Let's say a tissue has some, some relaxa relaxation phenomena, T1 in this case, it's a gray matter, and if we measure uh, the signal that is sensitive to T1 in different time points, we get a signal which is weighted by the T1 relaxation, right? And so if there is another tissue nearby, we have a slightly different or, diff or really different T1. In this case, this is time of relaxation. It, dep it actually depends on the magnetic field. This is for 1.5 Tesla. It's slightly elevated for 3 Tesla. Um, um, so what happened in here is that these two tissues have different relaxation uh, time. So if I would make an, an image, I would see, and it will it would be a snapshot in time of the relaxation process. There will be time, I wouldn't, wouldn't see anything. After four seconds, about four seconds, when everything relaxes, no matter wh who you are, uh, tissue which is like totally in the CSF, which everything is just water, or inside white matter, whatever it is, it's already relaxed. So there is no contrast. But in here, there is contrast. The relaxation of the gray matter is different than, than the one of the white matter in this case. And so if I will look two voxels, two, two regions, one in the white matter, one in the, in the gray matter, I will see a contrast. I will see a difference between these regions. I will show you that in a second. Okay. And that's, that's this, this uh, intuition is super important. That's is a full field in, uh, in medicine, actually, radiology, that harvests this phenomena, right? That's how we, I will see it in a second. That's how we identify lesion, uh, cancer, and so on in the brain, for instance. Okay? And so if you will write here the difference between the relaxation of the T1 of white matter and gray matter, we'll find that there is a time that will get maximal contrast. Okay? I just, I just did one minus the other of, of those two cares. Okay? So there is a point of time in time that, that we see this uh, contrast. I think there is something about it in the, in the Tirgul, right? I try. We actually simulate that and, and play with it. Okay. And so this is a typical T1 weighted image of a brain. Finally, a brain. Um, so, so it's actually it's not a real T1 map. It's weighted by T1. It's, there's a strong effect of T1. So we took took it in a specific time when the T1 effect is is a, is, is strong, uh, in a, in a way that the white matter here look brighter than the gray matter, and the ventricles here we look here for a, so a second in this axial looks totally dark. So we have main three contrast between three main tissue. Uh, tissue, yeah, tissues in the brain, okay? You can also see really nicely subcortical regions, right? Thalamus here and thalamus covered it, right? Um, and that's very useful. And, and maybe the classroom, never mind. Um, that's for s some of us actually work on this image in, in, a, in the first semester. And 
So this is an axial image. That means that we cut the brain like that. Actually, what happened in this image is that there are 3D images. You already measure a volume, and then you can slice it using imaging, um, image processing tool. You can make an image which is axial or coronal or sagittal. So coronal will be like that, okay? And sagittal will be like that. And there is tons of information uh, in, in those different planes, and they're super useful. For instance, I don't know, it's just, just beautiful to look at brains, right? You see here the corpus callosum, just the cut. The, the, the fiber that go between one side to the other, right? Here it is again in the mid sagittal. You can see that the tongue is bigger than the brain. I mean, there's things you can, you can notice uh, in this image, yes. Um, y we can do the same with T2, okay? There was a question. So I, I will get into it in, well, you m let's just, just explain that. We don't know. It was, I mean, you can measure what is the typical T1 of Wideman, what is the typical uh, T1 of, of Gramman. It's actually hard. That will be the second, the second part of this. Second, after the break, we're going to talk about those things called quantitative imaging. What people did is like, they kind of roughly, also it's diff probably slightly different between me and you. And so... People, but it's not so different that it will be drop. I mean, there, there will be a difference. It might be that in your brain we can get a better contrast giving a specific inversion time than in my brain. But the radiologists, well, let's talk about clinical use for a second, they will have some standard that they know that kind of giving good contrast, and that they do. And it's uh, fine. And also, they're using their eye, and the eye can overcome many like uh, differences. They w probably wouldn't notice even that it's slightly different. Um, and there, there is a full field in, in near radiology that say, oh, say if you put two, two inversion and then a ch play with that and play with that, we get a beautiful contrast that can really show you the, vent the I don't know, the, the blood vessels or something. And people are very excited about doing this manipulation, something without any theory, something with theory, something without just playing around and say, oh, you can see something which is very useful for the clinic. Um, T2, the same phenomena. Again, there is uh, here I'm putting it as, as a, against a, a, a time since excitation. Do you remember what was the phenomena that we used in T2? It's kind of hard. There was this issue with the echo. Do you remember that? Do you remember the echo? No. Um, so the echo was that we sh so do relaxation and, and things start to, to decay, and then we give a 180, and then so they start to deface, and we have 180, and they keep defacing, but because we, we flip them, they, they w this is the moment they, they again in phase. And so, that, so, the, the, so this time of, of, uh, of rephasing uh, was allowing us to measure T2. And so you can play with the time uh, of your uh, TE. TE is the time of echo, the time between, between the relaxation and when we do the, the 180. And then we're going to get a different weight of T2, different weighting of T2. Different ex uh, and so you c we can do the same game again here and get contrast between gray and white matter. The same story, similar to what we saw before in T1. Uh, notice that in here we're talking in milliseconds, here we're talking in seconds, right? T1 was much, much uh, longer. Okay. And so... What we're getting in here, and this is important, we're getting these weighted images, and I say, and, and it's important that they have no units. They have only contrast, okay? But it's very useful contrast. I mean, uh, we can do a lot of, we're gonna discuss in a second what we can do with this for research, and what we can do uh, for that for medicine. There is like so many people who, who, who did so many, there's so many articles about the fact that using those images which have only contrast, they have no units. But you could also, uh, take the, of the effort and measure it with units, okay? And then you would have map with units. What would you think we need to do to get something with units? Just guess. There is like there is no answer. That I don't I don't know that you know the answer, but you can guess. Will it will one measurement will be enough? You think? Why not? Yeah. 
even yes so you need to to so there is dependency let's say on inversion time or in time of uh, time of repeat or time OTE and so you have to measure it with different parameter and then fit the exponent so you have to take several measurements and then you can fit the signal okay so many or I, I took it from Nikola Stikov which is, is a famous researcher that the doing this quantitative imaging and so we say quantitative imaging is like a bento we separate each phenomena we separate the photon density effect the T1 effect there are several the, the diffusion effect, the, the MT effect, and the other one is like a soup. So this is a soup image. We're getting, it, it's weighted by T1, but it also has some T2, some photon density. It has everything inside it. We can try to uh, have more of one than the other. I don't know, so it will be a tomato soup. Okay? So we're gonna start with the soup, and then we're gonna move to the other one. Um, and so, just, just to notice it, what we just kind of said before. So this is the single equation of one of the of one of these of those images that keep showing you called SPGRs. Never mind, and I wouldn't get how we get to this equation. It's solving the the, the uh, solving the, the we, there, there are differential equations that describe this change in magnetization as function of time, and we, when we solve them in steady state after very fast uh, excitation, we can get to this equation. Not really important besides there is T1 and number of protons and T2 star. This is the three physical phenomena that are affecting the signal. And there are parameters that we can play in the magnet. We can play by alpha, which is how much excitation we give. And we can play with TR, which is the time between one flip to another. And TE, which is the time to echo. Fine. So this is parameter that we just put inside the magnet. We just code this. I put, give me this T, this TR, this flip angle, and then the signal will be will be dependent on those uh, on those three physical parameters and some kind of a constant. By the way, according to that, how many measurements do I need? We have three parameters. At least, probably at least three parameters. How many? You have three unknowns. There must be some, some mathematician who would say, how, I need then how many measurements? No, three. At least three, <laughs> right? At least three. The minimum is three to get all those three, right? And, and there, is no, there is no linear solution for this one, but we do it numerically. But you have at, le at, le have at, le have at least three different measurements with different parameters in order to try to estimate those quantitative parameters. And so if you, I will change TE, for instance, you can, say, you can see that I'm changing uh, this exponent. And so I'm moving from one, uh, I'm increasing the T2 star uh, weighting of the signal. That's how it looks. Uh, and in here, I'm changing the alpha. And so I'm, I'm changing the T1, it become more and more T1 weighted. Okay, because you see this, uh, the sinus and cosinus alpha is multiplied by, by the exponent of, the, of T1. Okay, so th those are the manipulation that we can do. Um, I didn't want sh to show you that. So what, so what should, what can I do with that? So let, now we have, we have images of branch. Cool. I can put any of you in the scanner, get an image. You can do it to uh, all the class. If you all uh, agree. Why would it be useful for research, for the clinic? For what do you think? You read it, I think you read about it a little bit. Or oh, you saw you saw a movie for this one. Uh, or both actually. Um, why having an image of a brain will be useful to anyone? Why do we waste our time here? Sorry? Your name? Michel. Development of the maze. To, to go and, and, and look on changes as a function of age. So do research, which is a developmental research, or maybe aging research. So what do you mean by that? What do you would, it's true, first, right, and then what would you do exactly? Just imagine, you play with it. Uh, would you look on what? You would take my brain, and then, and then my son's brain, and then my daughter, which is even younger, and you do what? What, what, what would you do? What can you imagine you can do? 
the size the size of what of all the image of some particular <laughs> of the brain as a whole. So it would look on the size of the brain. So I could do it probably outside the manga. We just put a, a some kind of a, uh, some kind of when people do that, right? And the and the and all the uh, the head it's itself is growing as function of age. That's true. But that's you could say oh that's only about uh, um, bones. What else? Look on the folding. You will check if the folding uh, maintain the same. For instance, that's okay. That, that, so that's very important, and this is true, and that's actually happening. There is a change in folding as function of age. Uh, and for to do that, I need to find a way. So th why why do I want that? I want I want to, to think what we need. We need a way to maybe identify the folding in each I in each in each image, right? And then compare the folding patterns, for instance. What else could I do, maybe? Okay, so let's say you find a, an region, say you really care about the thalamus. So you look on the volume of the thalamus, or maybe you have another measure of the thalamus, and then you have uh, some uh, hypothesis that it has to do with attention. So you run some kind of a behavioral a measurement about attention and do some kind of correlation between one to the other. M many people do that, actually. Okay, what else? Clinical population. Clinical population. And then will you do what? That's true. What else you can do with clinical population? I already said that before, even with a single subject. Look for abnormalities, like really something that, like you. So, so what would the radiologist doing? Say, I, I I look at so many brains. I know kind of how brain should look. There is gray matter, there is white matter. I don't know. The ventricle is about this size. There is some order in this, and suddenly it's like a bright object or something like that. So this is wrong, right? Uh, and that if that goes with some clinical uh, manifestation, you might you can make a clinical call that this is this disease or another disease. Okay. One last thing. I will give you a hint that the only thing that is on the walls. Okay. Uh-huh. You would need to identify a, uh, a region and then look on some group differences and relate it to. Okay, so kind of summarize what, what was said here for, for age and for attention together. Um, something that is on the wall. Why okay. matter is not on the wall? Functional MRI. What do you mean by that? Okay, you remind me your name? Ilan. 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 I knew that. Uh, I kind of knew that. Yeah. I want to be sure. Uh, and so with functional MRI, you would do what? Okay, so look on. Say it again. But so why do I need anatomy? Okay, so that's exactly what we have here from Udi, I think. Uh, pretty sure. Um, yes. No. Amir and Mehdi. Udi and Amir together. Uh, but, but many times we do, and every time actually, when we do fMRI, we have these functional m maps. You would see later. They're very hard to read, uh, and we typically push them and, and project them to to a, to a brain structure. And that's the, and those brain structures are coming from this anatomical measurement. So anatomical measurement is al almost always are used to look at, uh, at, at functional re results and compare between subject and see where it is and so on, okay? So that, that's what we have here. The color here is where activation were found, uh, projected on a, on a cortical uh, mesh that came from anatomy. Okay. So now see, you. okay, so I made you a list, and that was kind of what you were saying before. Here is a T2 weighted and T1 weighted, and this is a case of, uh, of stroke, okay? So that's very useful actually in stroke. 
use MRI that's actually contrasting those contrasts with, with diffusion is, a, is, is really critical to the very early stage of, of stroke to decide if we're giving a medication or not. I mean, several hours after, you cannot give the medication anymore, and, but there, in, there is a window when you can actually give medication that kind of resolves some, of the, some of, the, of, the, of the stroke phenomena, and that could be identified only using MRI and looking at different contrasts. So that's part of the, actually m m one of the big, biggest use for MRI in the clinic and there was a time that it wasn't in every hospital in Israel, and it was an issue. If you were in the per periphery, you wouldn't get MRI, you wouldn't get the medicine, and so on. Now it's not an issue anymore. Um, this is a case of tumors. Again, you can see uh, you can see tumors, and you can see them in different stages here in the T1 and T2. Okay. So this is the thing that people would use in the clinic in order to parcelate and. and and, and kind of and define a, a disease with MRI, right? And something we couldn't do without having MRI, so that's useful. Um, what else do I have in here? So yes, things you mentioned that was done er in the in the beginning many times. Um, you know, take this brain, you segment, let's say, the fusiform cortex or whatever you care about, temporal cortex, and so on. And then in this case, it's a longitudinal measurement. So we, we try to say what how area volume, so we just identify the region. In brain, in the, so each point here is the same subject in uh, some, I don't know, four years different. And they have many subjects, they scan them twice. And so now they can say, okay, we see a changing, which is a changing of, of, uh, of aging of this, uh, of this particular area. Uh, and you can do that by doing it looking to the lean. For each subject you do that in a particular region. And then you look on the, on, on the effect uh, as a whole. Okay, you mentioned. Also very down, down yeah. down. That's very important for them. So there is a down, but I mean, what could you do? You could take all like just single images and just look in, on the group on the group level. This one is better because besides that, you have the the whole group um, group level phenomena. You have also the single subject kind of like give you two points on this on this line, and, and then you can see that this trend that you see in the group is actually a real one even um, for individuals. Two options, like this one, for instance. I would guess that this one is an error. So th there are many, many problems. We, we will see some of them soon. So there are just no. Uh, actually, I think it's an error. Error of segmentation. So identify diffusion from it by itself is uh, is hard, and there might be here um, an error. But you put your error also in your measurement because otherwise it will be cherry picking, right? Um, Okay, so you mentioned it earlier, but particularly before it was volume, right? Volume of a region. What people also do is measuring. A it's not a slide I, I supposed to have in here. Fine. It's looking at cortical thickness. Uh, so we c we could take these images and try to measure the distance between gray and white matter, and parcelate the cortical thickness. So that's actually a very useful tool. We kind of mentioned that when we talked about uh, manifolds, right? And so, so that, that, that's actually a practice that is very common to measure cortical thickness with MRI. And then, then we can measure, for instance, changes in cortical thickness as a function of age. That's what this map shows you. So you identify the cortical thickness and then see how it changes as a function of age. And there's another thing which is, which is famous, which is called brain volume morphometry, VBM, which is kind of chain, measuring some kind of like main, ch main changes. Many people use that, and then you get this like uh, brain on fire, which kind of shows you where, where change were, were. And this one is, uh, it's an interesting one, this one actually, uh, in which they use, uh, they, use uh, they try to measure plasticity. They take the same subject, think they teach them uh, to do juggling, measure them before and after, so it's a really demanding task, um, involve vision and motor and learning, and so they measure it before and after and try to see if there is any ch brain uh, change, and they did find some using these tools, which I going to explain in a second, what are they. Okay, so we, that's why we, all of those are reasons why we would like that in, in a, um, a like a anatomical measurement. Another one is for, we already mentioned that, to project. 
there, um, I, I, I don't remember. We need to go and check. Uh, maybe, ah, if I remember, one of them was decline and one of them was an increase. So they, also, they found increase and decrease, if I, but I need to check just to make sure. It's a very famous article of, um, of, I, uh, of Heidi Johannesburg, uh, I don't have the second name. Uh, I, w I will send you the article if you want. If I remember correctly, th there was area of decrease. There was some controversy about this article as well. Um, the last bit, we already mentioned that. We can use it to visualize function. Okay, so now I want to go in more details um, to things we need to, having, having images, we need to do, there are things we need to overcome. So these image processing issues using, using, using brains. So there is here a list, uh, registration, segmentation, working with surfaces and smoothing. All of them are things that we need to be worried about um, when working with, with brain images. Um, so this image is coming from Shari's article in which he tried to show uh, actually a T1 weighted and a T B0, this T B0 is essentially a T2 weighted image as in she can show that sometimes she is the same subject, she measures them twice it, with two contrasts and sometimes it's actually is a good registration between two images, they fall one on top of the other and in another case they don't and then everything else that will come after with using these images will be wrong if, they're, if they are not overlapped. So what happened in here, and we're going to explain that, is that we first need to calculate some, ca so we have two images, let's say, of the same brain. Some things won't be the same brain. But something was slightly different between the, the first image and the other image uh, of the same brain, or maybe between my brain and your brain. And let's say we want to put those things in a common space. We first need to f calculate a, a, a matrix that re will register one image, the other image, so that will be registration. We'll find, we need to define some kind of transformation that move one image to the other image space. Okay, so that's a mathematical um, process that is really well known in image processing. And there is many things that are done in image processing that we need to now do when dealing with MRI images. Okay, and then we need to apply this transformation. So we need to actually to say to move it and moving an image is uh, including a. a extrapolation and, and some kind of estimation of, of, of the values in a location we actually didn't measure, right? We want to say it's here, we need to now interpolate the signal in order to say what is the exact value in this new position. Never mind if you didn't got it, uh, that's a, a bit hard. This, this, this idea of, of, uh, of resampling. Um, okay, so the most easy movement will be what? kind of written in here, but what it would be. I want to move image from one to another. Wh what kind of thing I can do to it? Rotation and translations. Okay, so there is three three dimension of, uh, so we can think about, it's called a rigid body. There is three dimension of translation and three dimension of rotations. Okay? That's the minimal uh, shift we can think uh, to do to, to, to 3D volumes. Okay? Um, so you can think about this plane, and we can rotate it and move it. Okay, so that that's the dimension that we need. We need to calculate those dimensions in order to do this registration. Um, we can add more parameters, so we can actually add stretch and shear. So that's adding uh, six more parameters. Okay, making so think about those squares. We we can we can do more more uh, still linear transformation in the sense that we we apply it once but the effect is not linear anymore. Um, and then what we also can do, and we sometimes do, is something called nonlinear registration, which is much more uh, aggressive. This is essentially taking this car and making it being this car, or making it be this car. We do that by, uh, maybe you can see it better in here. Take this car, you can see that it was transformed to be this car by pushing and shoving, and, and there is many, many local deformation that we do to the image in order to match between those two, okay? And that's something we also do. That's called nonlinear transformation, which includes warping. We warp one image to another, and that has billion, billion. But they have many, 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 many parameters. 
which all, all also mean what? Many. When you have problem with many parameters, either you have many measurement, and if you don't have enough measurement, but you might have overfitting, problem of noise. Like it's very hard to estimate that. It just become a, a hard problem, okay? Uh, that can can explode. And it has many times explode, although it's very common practice in MRI. You will define this deformation field, how much I need to stretch and move the image, okay, in different dimensions. And you can see it's not linear, right, it's like waves. Okay, segmentation. So the idea in segmentation is to define gray and white matter, and that has to do, so we can look in the histogram of the image and say, uh, let's say, here is gray matter, here is white matter, what, something like that. That's what we have in here, right? So we segment a, a gray matter to white matter, here to ventricles and everything else. So we can decide how many segments we want, and that will be very useful in a second. And if we have a better SNR, of course, we would have better uh, separated peaks in here. The, the, the SNR is better than here. So here you see the peaks are kind of closer to each other. And here they are farther away. And that gives us a better segmentation than in here. Just look at these things, where, you, where exactly is the border, and here it may be better to identify. Okay? Question? No. But if you listen to the language, it's a, become a language of image processing. So many people in CS, that kind of like, they, they, and there are people, for instance, there is if, even people in LSEC, like Leo Yoskovic, that's, they are image processing. Um, they, their profession is image processing, and, and they're using it to, to, to brain images, and so that's so this. This is like things that happen mostly in 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 engineering and and, and CS and kind of uh, penetrating to the, to neuroscience because these images are very important. What you can do, there are tools like this one called ITK Gray, which allow us to segment the brain and maybe then take. Let's say we take all the all the all the white matter and then grow on it the gray matter. And the nice thing about it is that we can now get meshes like this one, kind of remind us of this thing. And we can, if we want, we can uh, inflate it, right? It becomes an object, this mesh, which we can inflate and look on, on curvatures and so on, right? It becomes a very useful tool. I will just do very fast the smoothing issue because I know we need to be in a break. One last thing. Um, many times we smooth in MRI, many times, um, but, and in fMRI in particular, we smooth our images, but just remember that the fact that we know something about the curvature actually could be very useful. So what we typically when we smooth, what we do? We, we, we do what? What is smoothing? In averaging, averaging in MRI is points which are near in space. Being near in space in, in, in image space could be very far in cortical space, for instance, okay? That's not always been respected. And so think about these two points, they're probably centimeter apart. But in terms of image space, they're millimeter apart. And so, or many other times we will project everything to the surface to, to show a result, like done in here. We project into to the, to the surface. And it could be that something that came from here or came from here, they both will be projected to the same location. They might be very far away from each other. Um, so this is, think about this, this is the, 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 the smoothing operation. Whoop, I didn't mean to do that. But I should because it's time for break. No, no, let me just finish there. Oh no, my computer died. Break. <laughs> <laughs> I will finish this in a second. In next, after the break. Hmm? Yeah, it's hot.
between the need to do smoothing sometime and the fact that smoothing might be done in image space while the signal might be, it would be better to more, there is, there is a logic to respect surface, surfaces and sometimes being ignored, I want you to be alert to that when you read articles the, 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 the practice of smoothing may actually make a difference with in the effective resolution even if you use 8 mm smoothing kernel on an image space, you essentially have a centimeter resolution. If you do the same thing, but on a surface, you would actually have an 8 mm smoothing uh, uh, resolu 8 mm resolution. So that's, that's the, that can make a huge difference. Um, okay, so th the other option is that if you smooth, you smooth according to the, to the node of, uh, that, that, uh, that you derive from the segmentation. And another practice that I mentioned is this pro projecting, projecting result to the, to the surface. So that means that this point and this point will be bo both will be uh, been shown in here. And then when you see these images, the reason I'm, I'm actually wait, wasting time on that is that I actually never do that. But that's actually a common practice, which I want you to be alert when you see those things, that, you, that you at least know what you're seeing. Not always the people who do that understand what they're doing, but I want you to be alert. Um, so when then you write these reviews and they try to compare language tests and so on, so you say, you, say, well, you know, it's, it's all over, all over these temporal parietal regions. One reason is that the way they, they, they project their data to the, to the cortex, it was so blobby. And so they get a big blob, which different, different uh, uh, work get a different uh, result. Another option, is really use the, the surface uh, in order to, to identify the where the activation of the fMRI was and, and then people get to really tiny resolution of, of localizing of, of phenomena. For instance here, this is the phase region that many people also in LSEC using or researching this the fusiform versus the really nearby uh, VWFA which is, a, which is a reading area which I think also um, and is in interest for, for uh, people like Merava Hissar. Uh, so those things are very, really, really close by, and only if you actually respect the surface, you can actually start to tease them apart in space. Okay, yes, it would look like that, kind of remi reminding what we've seen here. Okay, so what I want to do, and I was hoping to do in the first hour, is now to explain to you what is VBM. Again, not because I find it the most interesting method, but it's super commonly used. So there is a good chance you would see either VBM or cortical thickness article. If you read, read a random article about MRI, it's a good chance it will be either VBM or cortical thickness article. So I want you to have some kind of uh, understanding of what it is. And then if we have time, I would go to the thing that I actually find interesting, which is the quantitative aspect. But let's go with what actually is mostly used. So VBM, it means uh, uh, voxel-based morphometry. What is morphometry? Morphometry forms, right? Size or shape. And sorry, and met and metric means size, right, or measurement. And they try to to measure uh, some kind of variability in form or in shape of the brain, say a function of age. In here, different than what we saw in the beginning, they wouldn't identify, let's say, the thalamus and look at the thalamus as function of age. They wouldn't segment first. They will do this kind of analysis. We'll just show them an area which have a different in shape. That's what they try to do in a in a whole brain kind type of analysis. Uh, so it's a whole brain analysis, exactly that. No prior. So you d they don't know that they want to work on the thalamus or on the cortex. They just say, let's see where, where there are changes. And this is an example of voxel-based morphometry image, uh, comparing people which have a uh, APO E4 um, allele, which means that they have a, a chance they will develop Alzheimer, for instance. And you can see if there is any kind of like, for instance, in this case, area which he showed like differences in shape even before they develop Alzheimer's. Okay? And you see here the brain is on fire. There are many regions like that. 
And the color code represents the statistical power of saying the, there is a change or there isn't a change. There is a, it's probably a change between those groups. That's the type of images. How they do that? So this is the pipeline. And see that there will be many things that we discussed before. So they first take the original image and compare it to a template. So they say there is a typical brain. It's a typical brain. They use my brain. What do I need to do between them? If I want, what should I do? What was the what is the process that I need to do? Registration. Registration. In this case, it's called a, even a normalization. You, because it's not the same brain. It's a different brain. So you <coughs> want to do this like the, the the aggressive one, the one that changes shape, right? With one car to another car. Um, so they first do the norm normalization. Now they get the same brain, but in the normal space. Wh why would they do that? Just to be clear, why should we normalize everyone to a template? The answer is in the question. Compare everyone. The everyone thing. Because we want to put everyone in the same space. That was important. So in order to do this analysis, statistics, as you said, uh, we need to put them in the same space. So that's why they took this effort and take a, each subject brain and put it in this template space. So now the next they will be able to compare them between them. Next, they use some priors that will allow them to segment. Say this is about how gray matter look like, about how, how white matter look like, about how CSF look like. Find me the voxels which are highly, highly probable be gray matter, for instance, or, or white matter, whatever we care about. So now they have a gray, gray matter segment of this brain in the normalized space. Next, they do something called a modification, which essentially normalizes it to be a value between 0 to 1. Okay, and, and okay, essentially uh, respect the fact that there will be partial volume. It might be a voxel which will be partly white matter, partly gray matter. So we need to, to take care of that. And last, they do what? Smoothing. And they do it in image space. So they, they blur the hell of the image, right? So they get the blur image they have it for all the subject. And so they have here now a value which they will call sometimes gray matter density, okay, because how much it was gray matter, the seg the, this gray matter segment, and they will compare this gray matter, so it's a value that we have now on all, on all, on all subjects, in any subject, in any position in the template, and we can do statistics on that, right? So that, that's the tool. And so you would create, let's say, two groups, group A and group B, and would ask if they are the same or not, Right, so we will have many subjects in this group, many subjects in that group. Maybe age is another thing that we want to factor. Whatever we want to factor, sex, age, whatever, size of the brain, we can add all of those to our linear uh, model that we build, and try to explain the gray matter ness, the, this value, using this coefficient. One of them is the beta of one group versus the other group, being in one group or in the other, and then we can do statistic of how how sub, how this this thing separate between one group to another. So we can do statistics about on, this, on those betas, right? And we have a way to compare groups, essentially without any prior besides putting them in, in, in this same common space and smooth them. And we'll have statistics that would say, uh, that will allow us to, to get this. What does it mean? You're a researcher, you just read, you're researching Alzheimer or whatever, and you read an article that shows that there is a blob here exactly where you're researching it in the, in the mice. So should you expect what, given that there is a difference between the group? Try, guess, think with me, anyone? The answer is that you cannot guess much. They call it gray matter density, but it doesn't mean much. There is a difference there. It doesn't mean that there is more or less gray matter. It doesn't mean much. Just given this processing, there was a difference there. So it kind of localized big morphometric change, giving the smoothing and normalization and everything else. It really, some people actually, it's, it's funny. They, they, in the first article, they say, we call it gray matter density, but don't confuse it from, with cellular density and so on. But then people forget. People really forget. So users sometimes think they actually measure a fraction of tissue. They don't. So when you read it, don't be confused as well. It, it means that the, there was a difference given this protocol of analysis, which is more than nothing, but that's what it is. 
Okay, uh, we skip that. You can also use the deformation. Is, is you can use that also for for your GLM. Never mind. A very famous article that was using that. Do you know this one? Of a, um, a, do you know this one? We the taxi drivers. Anyone? Yeah. It's a famous one. Maybe the most famous one. They they, they look on taxi drivers in London. Be, before uh, having an iPhone and Waze and everything else, so they actually had to uh, navigate, and they compared the time to, uh, for them of being being drivers, um, and uh, and the effect or, or on their hippocampus. So they are both using a VBM and looking on on, uh, on volume, and they found a change uh, in the hippocampus as function of the time they were they were drivers. Okay, that, and that was kind of like. This article kind of showing that it's a really useful tool because suddenly we can uh, locate very high cognitive function using this structural kind of crude measurement, right? Uh, but that opened uh, the door for many more work to come afterwards. Okay. So here we see a normal versus an Alzheimer brain, and I couldn't find to relate it was in the web everywhere, but I couldn't find where the source of this image. Um, and what is the thing you m might notice between those two brains? Sorry, Musa. The volume of the gram is really different, right? It's like there is less folding; it's shrinked, right? And there is much more space, right? So we can do that also <coughs> in MRI. So we can use that for do the cortical thic thickness measurement. We can use cortical thickness measurement to be able to quantify these effects. Maybe find it before it's like getting to this part when you don't need anything. This this subject probably in a very bad shape already. Okay, so here is a typical uh, cortical image, uh, and I just took another art another image from the same article that compared between control and NMS and, and uh, Alzheimer, and you can see those differences very similar to what we can see postmortemly. Okay, so this is useful. And so we can use this tool that identify the white matter, so the, the edge of the gray matter between the white matter and gray matter, the edge of the between the gray matter and the pia, and then quantify this distance. Okay? A and I will skip how we do this vertices and so on. There is many issues of how, how you end the error here and so on. What's interesting is that you can then get a map of cortical thickness in the brain, for each subject actually. We can get this hot map that identify the size in millimeter between the, between the, the gray white matter border to gray uh, pia border, okay? I just want to, m to tell you that this is actually, n while it's a very interesting measurement, it's not exactly a cortical thickness measurement. It, there is things that which are affecting that. You, you might handle a little bit of that in the, in the, in the tegul. Not really, not this thing, not this aspect. It's related, but it's not only dependent on cortical thickness itself. That's when people do the com compare it to, to post-mortem. So it, it's related to cortical thickness. It's not a pure cortical uh, thickness measurement. Um, we can find interesting phenomena, differences between uh, gyruses and, sul and, sul and sulcuses. When you see there, the, it's much narrower in here versus in here. And we can do a one more important thing when we're working in surfaces. Let's say we want to compare between subjects again. Because this is a mesh, right? Do you remember we can, we can, we can uh, uh, th think about it as a balloon. We can we create balloons of those ones. So it, it, uh, reducing the dimension from 3D to 2D, uh, and it's much easier to work with this one, and we can identify particular uh, soul site that are uh, and gyri that exist in all subjects, and using this this kind of, uh, of inflated branch to do the registration. And this registration, you remember registration? It, it's much easier and much better when you, use it, when you work with surfaces. And, so, and you can, so you can move them all to a common space in, in this inflated, uh, uh, inflated brain, and that always works better than using just the image space. Well, not always, but in many cases. There are great benefits in that. Uh, so that's another, using the surface is another way to create a common space. One more thing we can do is also identify atlases in the common space. Okay? 
say this is this gyrus, this is that, that gyrus, which are common to all of us. There are differences between gyrus and circuses between each of us, but there's also some things which are common. Everyone has calcarine, everybody has a uh, mitzagital, and so on. I mean, there are things which are, we are the, which are the same, and we can use those as features and then use that for registration, also create an atlas of where things are, and then create an atlas that segments the brain to regions, and that's very, very useful. And you can look about, think about changing volumes, in those regions and so on. So that's something we do a lot. And so we can even take uh, other assets, let's say, for instance, this program assets that you might heard of, which segment the brain according to psycho um, uh, measurement. This was a, a, a nissel staining, and project that to, to, to this space, and then by that, create the segmentation of Broadman uh, on, 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 each, on each and every one brain. Okay, and that's something we do. Yeah. We can use that to measure changes as function of age, for instance. Here is again measurement of effect, I think, of uh, how p this is this is a research that look on a, on a people which are specialized in a, a, in a, so they, they are a musician and they were, their ability here to comparison to behavior, their ability to to uh, separate pitch. And you can find area in uh, which the cortical thing is actually relate, correlate uh, uh, to this ability. And, th and that's, again, a way to, to use the structure to learn about high cognitive function or behavior, or relate between them at least. OK. One last bit. People use the fact that you have many measurements of many cortical areas with different thicknesses to then do a, a network analysis. That, that's a very tr uh, there are ma three, three ways to do network analysis uh, on brains. We'll mention them along the way. This is one of them. Uh, so here we, we use the fact that we have cortical thickness of many regions on many subjects. And we can, su can ask if things change together. So create a correlation matrix of how let's say area A change uh, related to area B across subject. That gives us a weight. And having this matrix, we can ma now create a, a network analysis, uh, use this, this, this correlation matrix to generate a, a, a network and to say which area to co-vary together. And that derive a, a network, which is very interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting way to, to, to create um, to identify networks in the brain based on anatomy. Okay, and the break was should, should have been here. Okay, so now at the time I have, I would like to talk about quantitative aspects. So you remember we in the beginning say there is qualitative uh, images and there is quantitative images, right? And also the, one of the article you read was kind of mentioning that, right? There is parameters, quantitative parameters, photon density, T1, T2, which they have physical units, in this case, relaxation T1 in seconds. And this is the qualitative image we use until now, right? In here, we, all, we, all the thing we did was essentially derived by methods which came from uh, image processing and statistics. We had an image, we did interesting thing with it. We normalize it, we smooth it, we register it, we did things with it. And to, to do some kind of group comparison, for instance. In here, we use the fact that they are units and try to give it a, some kind of a biophysical meaning. So that's the benefit of having units. It's also related to what we do in the lab. Um, so just to remind you, the, we already mentioned T1 and T2 and T2 star and this. I just remind you that we kind of know what, what this phenomenon in terms of, at least in terms of the physics, okay? Um, so now, if we take this T1-weighted image, there is actually a single... So the idea is that this, this T1-weighted image that was before just weighted, it's actually... We know a lot about it. We know the single equation that explains it. I already mentioned it before. So what we need to do... So we carry, let's say, about proton density or T1. What we need to do is to take several measurements and then fit. It's a nonlinear fit in this case. There is a way to linearize it, but it's a nonlinear fit. Uh, that will allow us to, to capture this T1 phenomena or this proton density, 1 minus proton density. Uh, that's what I'm plotting in here. And I would argue this is give us some kind of uh, additional information above 
to just image that we had before. Now we have something with units. So we now can do what across subjects? In least of, in least instead of comparing, let's say, a morphometry or thickness, we can compare what? Who want to guess? What we can compare if we have a measurement with units? If I would measure height, and I would have units of height, what I would compare between between subjects? Their height, because I have a measurement. Otherwise, they're tall, short, tall, short, look, they look tall, they look short. That's what we did until now. Now I would say, this is meter and a half, this is, uh, I don't know, 1.6, 1.7, and I can do a group comparison, right? I would have units. And so the main benefit of having units is that you can make your comparison in a more straightforward way. You, you have units to compare. Another benefit that these units, because this is just physical units, this is a way to try to interpret them and say what do they actually mean in terms of biophysics. Okay, fine. They have different relaxation. Why do I care? I don't. This is not exactly height, right? But it might have something to do with the amount of myelin, for instance, in the tissue. And that's already interesting. Uh, just before we go to that, I just would mention, I mentioned it before, we need to take several measurements. And then we can fit the model. The, the main problem is that to do that, we really need to know what was the, the, this variance in the equation. There are variance like alpha and TR, okay? And the problem is that our scanner, and that's something to know about scanner, they are not calibrated as we think they are. We write, I want flip angles of 10, I'm gonna get something about 10. And so, Actually, don't, I, want, I think the measurement is the same all over. It's actually not the same. The distance from the, the receiver actually make a difference. So now I have to handle all this, what we call inhomogeneity, imperfection in the magnet. Okay, the magnet is not perfect, not really uniform as we want it to be, which make it hard to fit a model which have a meaning. Okay? And so what we have to do, whoop, what we have to do is actually quantify those bias functions. And that's a pain. But then if we are and we have measurement with units, we can try to do a biophysical um, uh, modeling. Okay, so just to remind you, uh, relaxation has to do with interaction of water with their surrounding. Uh, and along this line, what people uh, found was that this is, this is important work, which we compare a post-mortem uh, myelin staining quantitative myelin staining, which is kind of hard even for people who are doing post-mortem, because it's hard to quantify myelin. And they compare it to the T1 relaxation of the same particular tissues, and they find that in, in white matter, you can extend much of the variability in, in, in myelin by T1. Wonderful, we say, okay, we can use that as a myelin, as a measure for myelin. Um, and so, uh, Fine, we did that. We, also, we did that along the wide method. That's what this article showed. I, I wouldn't get into that. And we can show that, we can use that then to compare controls. This is like the normal distribution to, to MS patients when they have a disease in, in, in the myelin, okay? So that become a tool to compare um, control to patient. You can define what is normal and what is abnormal in a more, in a more uh, subtle way and can actually ch check changes in function of time in a more subtle way when you have units. I want to mention just other types of quantity measurement because there is actually a variety of those. Okay, I mentioned until now I showed you T1. I also showed that in the background a proton density, but I'm not going to get into that. That's also possible. Um, another one, a very popular one, is, is coming from T2. People notice that actually when you look at the brain, there is no one single relaxation. There are several relaxations. Some of them fast and some of them slow. You find you can actually fit the signal by three exponents, which have interaction between them. It's a painful fit. Um, and they, they notice that the, f the faster one uh, can be uh, related to water that is stuck between the layer of myelin along the axon. So I would have an image in here. If this is an axon, this is a cross section inside an axon, and there is here membrane another bed, another membrane. You know, you know how myelin works, right? There's layers of membrane. There is water in here, and the relaxation is super fast. And the fraction of that can be related to the relaxation of the fast component 
the fast exponents, okay? So this t t2 uh, is built from different three different exponents, and one of them is called the myelin water fraction, okay? So that becomes a very sensitive measurement. And the main problem with it is just it's really hard to measure it. It's very long. Because it's very long, people do it in very low resolution, so it looks in the end like that. But it's a very interesting measure in the sense that it's very specific to specific biophysical phenomena. Um, and here is a validation of this. This is a, a post-mortem work in which they identify an axon using uh, histology and EM and quantify the fraction of uh, the volume of, of myelin and compare the, the myelin as measured with histology versus what they measure with T2. And you can see a really nice agreement. This is different, different rats, I think, uh, which have different myelinization along the corpus callosum. Okay, so the each point here is a different, is a different sample. Okay, so it works pretty nice. It's interesting. We're measuring something which is a microstructure phenomena using measurement which is really coarse in a way, in the resolution in millimeter and so on. But we get this very, we get sensitivity to to this really microstructure phenomena in the tissue. Questions? I kind of like move to like talking without stop. Um, interest question something. Okay. I will go to to another phenomena, and it's called magnet. It's called magnetization transfer. This is even a harder. If uh, until now the physics was kind of hard. One more layer of that. In here, what we do, instead of excite, uh, typically we were exciting what, what, what type of protons we were exciting? Hydrogen. Hydrogen off? Of water. But there are other hydrogens in the tissue, right? What about them? We kind of we ignore them until now. Do you remember why I was allowing myself to ignore them? What I was saying about them. Maybe I didn't. What happened with them? I didn't say. The, on reso the, the frequency of, of, uh, of excitation and on reso on re in resonance is shifted. They're not in the, they're not in the same, see, they don't need the same. In order to excite them, I need to excite in a different, uh, in a different frequency, okay? So given the, their structure, they, they're connected typically to carbons. They have a, they're, they're just different. They, they don't move in space. And so in order to excite them, I need to use a different frequency. Another radio frequency, but a different one. So until now, I, I was, it was kind of easy for me just to ignore them. Say, ah, oh, never mind about them. We'll only take about water protons. Now I say, oh, I'm going to actually deliberately uh, excite in this off-resonance pulse, in this off-resonance uh, pulse, right? And then I'm going to excite these other protons. Okay, so why I'm not doing that all the time and measure them directly? Who cares about what? So let's talk about sugars. Let's talk about... Uh, Proteins and so on, right? They all of the, all of them have have, uh, have hydrogens. First, you need a field like that called spectroscopy. Okay. Second, I'm not going to talk about it. The problem is their signal is really weak and it's ha really hard to measure them. So people do that. They typically use a huge voxel centimeters in order to get something. Okay. It's really big. Not going to talk about it in this course. But there is a secondary effect. You excite those protons and they transfer their energy to, to, the water, to the water protons, okay? If they transfer their energy, essentially they excite the, the, uh, those water protons. Those water protons, you can think of about them as protons that cannot participate anymore in, this, in, the, in the normal on resonance effect. On resonance is water protons, okay? So if I first excite off resonance, that will, uh, uh, the effect of that will be that when I measure afterwards on resonance, I excite off resonance, and then do the, the normal on resonance experiment, I would have less signal. Okay? Some of it will be already part of this magnetization transfer and I will lose it. And so, giving an off resonance before on resonance, I'm going to get an effect. I will see an effect of those protons on the water. On the water. The signal will be weaker. Is this okay? Yeah? Um, so, so people do exactly that. So we have these water protons, right? And they will call the free pool, and there will be the protons on on on, uh, on macromolecules and, and phospholipids, and that will be the bound pool, and we will excite those one, 
let's say in myelin, okay, and we see the effect on the water. And what we'll, we'll look at sometime is, is on, try to quantify the fraction of this bound pool. How much, given that I gave some, some energy to the, to the, to the macromolecules, okay. see, how much signal reduction I had in my own resonance, and that will give me a way to quantify the fraction of those. Okay, so that will give you a measure of the macromolecules. And people again relate this to, uh, to myelin because myelin is really rich with macromolecules and phospholipids, which have these this, uh, hydrogens. And they call it sometimes a quantitative magnetization transfer or BPF, the bound pool fraction. And people suggest it's, it's really highly related to myelin again. Let me just skip that. This is in, in order to, I wouldn't skip that. In order to do this kind of measurement, it's, it's, this is a real pain. You need to measure not only your own resonance measurement, which we had before, you also need to measure all different off resonance measurements. And then you have many measurements, and you have enormous model that you need to fit, enormous mathematical model that you need to fit, in order to quantify this phenomena that you care about. It becomes really risk tricky. What you might think that might happen to me here? Again, we kind of that we can, I, the problem is that in humans I cannot scan forever. If I would scan forever, like hundreds of measurements, it will, I would be fine. But uh, I will take the minimum that I need, eight, something like that. Then what happens sometimes to my fit? If I really minimum the minimum amount of measurement that that I can that I need to fit the model, but not more than that. There is a risk that what happened. We already mentioned that. You have noisy measurement, you take only the amount of measurement that you actually need. What might be really, uh, extra, sorry? You might overfit, you might be very sensitive to noise, particularly when those measurement goes through this equation, which sometimes you divide things and so on, they might, they might, go, uh, cause, for a, they might cause for the noise to, to really explode. And that's something what happens with these things. So it's not a simple model even. Um, Okay, many measurements. But again, when people try to do validation, the same, the same group, the same, the same uh, strategy of validation, you can see that uh, the, the myelin estimate from histology really agreed well with the, with the myelin estimation from this, uh, this MRI uh, analysis. That's good. So it again, means that we have another way to measure kind of the same things again. Okay. One more thing that people uh, do with MRI and quantitative MRI, they're using the fact that there is R2 star, another measurement which related called R2 star is like T2 star, okay? And what, what people notice is that it's really, really sensitive to the amount of iron we have in the tissue, okay? So another, um, another thing which is, well, amount of, of iron is, is a phenomenon that it is in the, in the nanoscale, right? It's like the concentration of, of, of iron. And we can show that with this kind of measurement, which is really sensitive to the dephasing alto star or T2 star, we, re we can get a, a relative good measurement of the, the fraction of, of iron in tissue. That becomes really important in different diseases and in aging in general. The uh, amount of iron change as function of age and the uh, area like uh, substantia nigra and others. Uh, aggregate more, and that become that become important uh, to be able to measure. Okay. So in the last, uh, probably will it, be, uh, it will be okay. I will just mention several more ideas that people use. I will do it pretty fast, I think. Um, the, all those models are kind of hard, right? Like we need many measurements, and it's a complex model. People try to sim simplify that. Um, and for instance, this is a, a, a known simplify method called MCDS, but that's really not important. You just take many, 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 many assumptions, and then the model becomes much harder to fit, and you need less data. What is the risk with that? I will say again. We have a model which needs many measurements, and even then, it's kind of like a not really well constrained, really sensitive to noise. So the other approach was let's well, just uh, take assumption, and then the problem becomes much easier, and we can solve it with less measurement and 
the, the measurement list will be more reliable. I can scan it again and again, it will be okay. But what, what is the problem here? Might be the problem. Yes, making wrong assumptions. That's the problem. Uh, particularly if this assumption, you, you don't really check how good are they. Um, so that, that's a, tr th well, that's, well, we, we have this game all the time in any field. You want to make your problem as easy, as simple as you can. You're making assumptions. This assumption might be maybe valid only sometimes. It's really hard to check how if they're valid all the time. And that might penetrate to your, me to your measurement and, and then for the interpretation. So this is an, a good example of, of a method which have is many assumptions and then fit all this com very complex smiling water thing in a very fast and efficient way. But the main critiques against it is that it takes so many assumptions that we're not sure that it's actually fitting mining water fracking anymore. But still many use it because, well, people have to, maybe that is a, uh, people need to make decision when they do their, their research in the end and, and sometimes they will take, uh, they prefer having the measure and then they have nothing. So we don't have the time for instance otherwise. Okay. Another very really fascinating uh, idea that people came uh, came off a, a, a and thought a, about, and it, it's really I mean, this is just this is this is just to let you know what's going on right now, because this is really I'm not going to explain it. it. It's really complicated. Not sure if I understand it fully, but the idea here is that was re recently published in Nature. You say we're gonna instead of actually fit measuring many many measurements, each of them, but again another image and another image and another image. No. Let's not do that. It take forever. We're gonna uh, we're gonna change. Uh, we're gonna excite and relax. or excite and relax in s almost random way. We don't, and we're never gonna get let it even relax. We're gonna just shake the system as hell. So if you look at the images, they look like hell. They look like nothing. Um, they look like that. But then they go and solve the equation that they think derive the MR physics th that. That, that underlying in terms of MR physics and, and the, they solve them as function of, uh, of time. That allow them to then, they solve them many times. They, they create a dictionary of solution and they ask how my signal that was varied in time in a, in a, in a crazy way, how, how, how similar it is to, to the solution that I, I made to, to those uh, differential equations in time. And they pick the best fit and for each position, and, and by that they're getting a T1 map, a T2 map, photon density map, and suddenly that becomes very fast. And, and so they kind of, it's like the field is now in, in, a, in, a, in a turn. It was really hard to do this quantitative measurement once, but now it becomes suddenly really easy and very expensive to get this soft, their self swerve. But that will just this function of time, right? That, that will become something that everybody has, and so that will having this one view has become more common and faster, take five minutes or less, two minutes, and we get every, all the information. So essentially they, they, they discover that if they just shake the system, instead of actually get it to a full image, they never get an, a real image. They just sh they shake the system in a way that they understand and they try to fit the chain as function of time. Okay, that's, that's what they do. Um, other approach, I, I will mention that just because it's really common. Uh, so, any of you heard about the Human Connectome project? Do you, do you know what it is? Yeah. And you from there? You were there? Okay. So, so Human Connect. So, uh, do you want to say what is the Human Connectome project? So they're creating a huge data set. That's what they're doing. They got a they got a huge grant from the uh, from from the NIH I think to create a huge data set um, measuring uh, many subjects in a, in the same in the same way. It's important to measure everyone in the same scanner they fit or in the same same standard. So they're measuring very basic fMRI measurement, which we'll talk about in in a few weeks. They're measuring a very common diffusion measurement that we're going to talk about in next week, and they're measuring anatomical measurement. And they also take a behavioral measurement. And so they have thousands of brains, and they release this data so everybody can use it. So when you're going to talk, think about your project in the end, you can remember that this this one option to look at this uh, at least at this data. Um, 
So using this uh, human connection data set, um, uh, what they also provide, they provide something that look like myelin. Say if we divide, uh, that's an another innovation they had, if we take a T1 weighted image and a T2 weighted image, you remember the one that we saw in the beginning? And instead of doing all these quantitative things, we're just going to divide one by the other. Say, so you know what's going to happen? It's going to boost the contrast because the, the contrast is flipped. And it's going to remove all the shared biases that they have. So I told you before that there are biases. We need to feed the bias and so on. So we're gonna just going to divide it out. And, so, and so, so they did that. They divide those two images. And then they project them to the cortex. So now you know what they did in here, right? They took, they create, they, they create cortical, cortical meshes and project the value of one divided by the other in each point. And say, so you know what? We look at that and we see patterns. Areas which have greater values versus areas which have lower values, right? Red mean more. And they noticing that, for instance, the calcarine and here, uh, uh, central sulcus, sulcus have very high myelin or whatever, yeah. very high values, and, so, and they, then they look on myelin stains, so this is exactly the areas when we see higher myelinization within the cortex. And so they term it myelin staining. Everybody uh, say they're wrong. It shouldn't be myelin, shouldn't, they, they overstate. And I think they overstate, it's probably not just myelin. But it's a very nice tool. It's a very nice tool to see microstructure without taking the effort of quantitative imaging. And one of the people who did that is the guy that he saw the movie of Van Essen, okay? one of the author of this work, so Glasser and Van Essen. Uh, so this, some people call it myelin measurement, some call it T1 divided by T2. You might see that, that's what it means, okay? Um, other did the same thing with MT. Uh, so instead of just taking many measurements, we're going to take one without, one weight, we're going to divide them, or do, typically do one minus the other divided by without, that gives us ma magnetic transfer ratio, it's called MTR. It's also as good. Remove most of the biases, uh, really uh, increase the contrast. We get the nice images. Again, look very similar to, to the one we saw before. Get this typical uh, mining like staining. Okay? Um, and Maybe I will finish with that. I will just finish with another article which you, you will deal with the in the in in the Tirgul, right, guys? This one, the, the lower one, when they change the parameters. Okay. So what they did, what those guys do, did, because there is a trend, right? People say, ah, let's just not take all those measurements. Let's just divide things and so on, or just look in, on on one measurement. What they show us here that they just took synth the synthesized images and changed the amount of R1, R2, PD in those images and check what happened to all those measurements that, that we saw before. And they show that it's actually changing the, the result. You might get more bigger cortical thickness, different cortical thickness, uh, thing will look more myelinated, less myelinated, just according to how much we put from each quantitative uh, aspect in sy when synthesizing it. Which means that what, what they would suggest is that there is still a, this is something we still need to be worried about and try to quantify if we really want to get the real measurement. Otherwise, doing it in one scanner and another scanner might might change the result. There is, will, will be might be more than one effect that look the same and kind of going to be mixed. Okay. So this is the the debate that exists in the field, and and it's not solved debate. People to people still use using one of those many measurements I showed you, and they all say that their method is the only one to use, and the other is just a waste of time or or useless. It depends where they are in the in the in in this uh, in this access, yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs>